Uh, now's the time where things get hard. Not in this class, same concepts, but in the semester. <laughs> starting the, the dog days of the semester, starting to get to the end. Okay, so we just need to refocus. We need to just keep plugging along one day at a time, but little bites of the action. today, I'm going to go through joint by joint, not reteaching, but going over specific illusions uh, that you'll probably see um, in the real world and, uh, and, and on the test. So the wrist joint, as a reminder, made up of your radius, your ulna, and your corporal bones. When I say the ulna, it's really the radius because it's the radius articulation with the corporal bones that stays consistent. Meaning, the radius, as you remember from last week, wraps around the ulna, right? The radius rotates about the ulna in open chain, and all of those corporal bones go with the radius, okay? So the ulna, there's space there, but the reason, if you look at an x-ray, there's a little bit more space than normal is so that those corporal bones, look at how much articulation is with that radius. It's actually kind of cool, bless you. There's two states, I forget which one is going to like uh, Delaware and Vermont. And like one starts skinny at the top and it works its way up to being thicker on the bottom. And the other one's the exact opposite. It starts off thicker at the top and it works itself to be skinnier on the bottom. It's like taking a, a grilled cheese and cutting it diagonally and you have one has the thicker piece on the bottom and the other has the thicker piece on the top. The same concepts happen with the radius and the ulna. I say the same, but very similar. Where you have the radial head being kind of thinner or smaller, proximally, and then as you work your way down distally, it gets thicker at the distal end because it's gonna be articulating with most of those corporal bones to flip them over. For the ulna, it starts off big and thick proximally, and then actually works itself out to be thin distally, okay? So it's really that radius articulating with the corporal bones to be able to send the carpals along for the rod, for the radial energy. So with the wrist, flexion extension, follow the fingers, guys. I'm actually trying to make this class, I, I know it gets tricky with illusions, but think about, I think I mentioned this last week, how much more <coughs> difficult it could be if we worked in articulations and bony articulations and you gotta know this, this. That's like saying we're gonna learn the states and while we're learning the states, you gotta know every major city, you gotta learn every major water. I mean, that's a lot of information. And one day, some of you are gonna need to know those things. But in my opinion, that's geography. Anybody can just go memorize cities. The harder thing is can you see what may not be easy to see so that you can apply what others cannot apply, okay? So for our wrist joint, flexion and extension can get confusing if you've learned it. Flexion is when the fingers go full. Extensions when the fingers go back. That <coughs> makes, it not only makes zero sense, it, it, it only fits a certain rule when all of the conditions are in such to fit that rule. I can have flexion where my fingers go up. I can have flexion where my fingers go down. I can have flexion where my fingers go back, okay? So a rule that I like to use is Follow the fingers. I didn't teach you interphalangeal motion. I didn't teach you metacarpal phalangeal motion. You know why? Because you get in the fetal and you get out of fetal. Flexion, extension, flexion, extension, flexion, extension. So instead of taking time to teach you 
proximal interphalangeal joint, distal interphalangeal joint, specifically the first interphalangeal, second proximal, second distal, third proximal, third distal, fourth proximal, fourth distal, fifth proximal, fifth distal, finger flexion, finger extension. So that you can just follow the fingers to wrist flexion. Get into a ball. Tie a finger, tie a string to my fingers. Finger flexion, wrist flexion, elbow flexion, shoulder <coughs> flexion. It was my youngest son's birthday yesterday. <laughs> a little party favor that you blow in unfurls. Follow the fingers. So if you follow the fingers, it doesn't matter if I'm in anatomical position, finger flexion, wrist flexion, or if I'm pronated, finger flexion, wrist flexion, or I'm semi-pronated, finger flexion, wrist flexion. If I'm here, extension, flexion. If I'm here, extension, flexion. If I'm there, extension, flexion. It has nothing to do about forward, back, side to side, in, out. Because the wrist doesn't care about ups and downs and ins and outs and sides to sides. Does that make sense? Okay? So if I do something like this, unfortunately, a certain percent of you, percentage of you are gonna miss it. And I'm here to tell you why and hope that that we bet a thousand as a class getting it right. I know that won't happen. It's nothing personal. It's just law of, law of large numbers. You know, when you have a lot of people in a class. I mean, think about it, guys. Think about you guys that come to class this morning. Look around and say, man, there sure is more people when we take a test. Okay? These are the kind of questions. It's amazing, huh? It's like uh, we're that, that TV show Survivor and they're getting voted off the island. <coughs> start, finish, or if I want to go this way, start, finish. Globally, it may look like the same thing's happening. My fingers are pointing this side, and then my fingers are pointing that side. But we don't assume, right? Rock. We don't assume. So you can't say they're doing the same thing. They may, but we don't assume it to be so just because both sets of fingers are pointing that way and then both sets of fingers are pointing that way. It's not like, or it doesn't have to be like when the elbows look like they're doing the same thing and they are. Like, you know, this looks different. One's going up and the other's going down. But in this case, the wrists are doing opposite things. My left has flexion and my right has extension. And that's okay. If I wanted both to have flexion, it would look like this. Bilateral extension, bilateral flexion. Follow the fingers, okay? So in the wrist, the frontal, as we talked about, is the ulna and the radial deviation. The biggest illusions that happen there is when we are doing functional circle of grip activities, um, grabbing things, holding things. Uh, you know, if, if you have a cup and you want to reposition it, you know, let's say uh, you work in, in the service industry and you're, you're having a tray and you're trying to keep it balanced and you're moving through the people, kind of like how we want to keep our head balanced sometimes, how we're going to compensate by moving our neck or our trunk. Same thing happens with our grip. We may need to keep our grip on something and as we bring it up, if we don't move our wrist, it may spill on the back, right? So like imagine like grabbing a gallon of milk and you grab it and you lift it up it makes sense that if I want to keep my fingers parallel with the ground, I would need to move my wrist as I flex my elbow. Does that make sense? 
So again, it may look like there was no movement because <coughs> you didn't see the fingers move, but you had to have wrist motion or else throwing the water in my face or the milk in my face. So start, finish, ulna deviation. We have a lot more ulna deviation than radial deviation. There's a reason for that. There's a lot more times where we're gonna have ulna deviation to cancel out elbow and shoulder motion as we grab things, move things, hold things. Imagine taking a baby and newborn baby and, and it's just getting the head strong enough to be able to support its weight and you grab the baby and you wanna bring the baby up to give it a kiss or to play with it or to play pea pie or something and you take the baby and you don't have all the deviation, you're literally just gonna <laughs> tilt the baby like this. The only deviation is gonna keep that baby level as you bring it up, does that make sense? Radial deviation, all the deviation. So that's probably the biggest illusion with the radial ulna joint, uh, not radial ulna joint, the wrist joint, is gonna be radial and ulna deviation. For the upright row example, we'll have ulna deviation as we bring it up. See how it's deviated to the ulna? So start out mostly anatomical at the wrist and we bring it up and we have ulna deviation. How would we have to go back? We'd have to radio deviate to go back. I meant we had the ulna deviate when we left, okay? Where were you at? Where did you go? And how did you have to move to get there? Guys, I am, I am at my wits end, not literally, because I'm trying to be more patient. Um, if you come to class late, late, eventually I gotta draw the line somewhere. Okay. So I'm just gonna keep going. All right. Any questions about the wrist? We'll do some practice stuff at the end of the class, but look, look at all this, look at all this stuff, look at all this, this practice, and remember from exam one and two, I asked a ton of questions from, from you. Just saying. Radio on the joint, pronation and supination. Wrap, unwrap. Say uniaxial pivot joint. The difference between a hinge joint like the door is that when you <coughs> rotate the door about its long axis, there is general motion that's happening. There's rotation and there's also translation of the center of mass. A pivot joint is a uniaxial joint, but instead of like a hinge door, it's like a revolving door. It's more pure rotation. Do a revolving door, it's not just one side, it's all the sides. It's like a merry-go-round for doors, okay? So the pivot joint of atlas axis and the pivot joint of radial ulna. What's cool about the radial ulna joint is kind of like the middle finger kind of serves as the polar axis. Not literally, but just to kind of see how this, the middle finger would kind of be, the third digit would kind of be like the revolving door that you could kind of see the rotation happening about, okay? Like a ballerina um, or a figure skater spinning on their toe so that they can spin more efficiently. Is this wrist? No, wrist is moving, or that you may think it is, but this is wrist, this is wrist. If I actually try to twist my wrist in the transverse plane, it's not going anywhere. That's how I know that motion isn't wristy. Okay, radio ulna, radio ulna. Wrap and unwrap. What was the trick that I taught you guys about seeing wrap and unwrap? <coughs> thumb rule. Absolutely. You can call it whatever you want because I'm I'm made up and I invented thumb rule. So you can call it whatever you want. But the point is, is that because the wrist doesn't twist, that means that the pinky side will always be ulna and the thumb side will always be radial. That's why this trick works. So if your thumb is lateral, you're supinated. If your thumb is medial, you're pronated. And on holidays and weekends. You know, if your thumb 
doesn't line up with your radius, that's a bad day. It's a bad day. You had a, a tragic injury to the original one. What do we call the position that's halfway? Semi-pronated. Why not semi-supinated? Absolutely. Very well, very well done. Supinated is anatomical, so the only way to get halfway is to have pronation. If anatomical was prone, then this would be a semi-supinated position. There's reasons for these things, guys. That's what I'm trying to teach you, so that it doesn't get confusing. Okay? So the three positions that I'm going to hold you accountable for, for the radial joint, anatomical or supinated position. Why is anatomical supinated, but my wrist isn't considered extended in anatomical? What was the reason for that? Absolutely. Very well done. And if someone said that on the left, I just didn't hear you. Um, Wrist can extend and flex from anatomical. My radial joint can't. My radial joint can't supinate from anatomical. It's, always, it's already at the end of the row. Same thing for the knee, same thing for the elbow. If I've said it once, I've said it seven times. That's why I think most people confuse the word hyper and they want to include it for every motion because the most commonly injured hyperextension are the knees and elbows, but those are already in an extended position, so any extension above is gonna be hyper. So it makes sense that people wanna say, well, my wrist is in anatomical, so any extension from anatomical is gonna be hyper. It's not how it works. Hyper is just excessive beyond your normal range of motion. This is normal extension from anatomical. If I did this beyond my normal height. Okay. Pronation, supination. Let's do a couple practices. We'll start off super duper easy. Anatomical, pronation to a semi-supinated position. Pronation from a semi-pronated position. Supination to semi-pronated position. Supination from semi-pronated position. See how that works? In biomechanics, I'm gonna teach you quadrants. I'll teach you quadrant one, quadrant two, because you're gonna have some muscles that can pull in both directions, not at the same time, but depending on your position. Okay. Get a little bit trickier when we flex the elbow. This is what you would probably introduce to. Supinated position is the soup bowl, okay? I'm not saying that's not true, it just doesn't always look like a soup bowl. Over your head, this is actually pronation, and I have a soup bowl. This is supination, pronation, supination, pronation, supination, okay? But it's all about the wrap and the unwrap. My thumb is lateral, don't believe me. My thumb is medial. I do this to show you that I didn't change the perspective from the back of my hand touching my head. Medial. Lateral. Okay. The wrist can throw people off. The wrist can be distracting. So in other words, we did this with um, the hip, external, internal, external, internal, external, internal, just like the foot can be distracting, the wrist can also be distracting. Pronation, supination, 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 pronation, supination. But the thumb rule still applies. Thumb is still lateral. Thumb is still medial. Okay? So if I did something like this on the test, I 
did the radio ulna joints do the same thing or something different? Don't answer it right away. Let's make sure we're all doing the same thing. Your fingers actually, because we're mirroring each other, actually want to face that way to start. They're, the fingers are pointing to my left. Okay, so if you want to try this at home, have your fingers point to your left. Then rotate your radio on the joint to have your fingers point to your right. Spirit, I did a little spirit sprinkles in there for effect. First a cartwheel, then the spirit sprinkles. Last week I sang opera. It's never know. Did they do the same thing or different things? We're not even getting to what they did. Just try to see if they did the same thing or if they did different things. I'll try to help you. Does the radio on the joint have anything to do with the wrist? Yes or no? No, I can bring my wrist back to anatomical. It's not gonna change the position of my radio on the joint. True? Does the radio on the joint have anything to do with the elbow? No, I can put my elbow in anatomical position. I don't change any position of the radio on the joint. Does the radio on the joint have anything to do with my shoulders? No, I can bring my shoulders in any position I want and it doesn't affect the position of the radio on the joint. Is this an easier way to see the position that I'm in? My left is pronated and my right is supinated. And I didn't change anything of the radioma joint. Nothing to do with the wrist, nothing to do with the elbow, nothing to do with the shoulder. I went from here to there. Now you can take the long way if it helps you. I don't care. I just want you to get to the destination of understanding. Or you can take the shortcut. Where's my thumb? My left is medial, and now it's lateral. Because we analyze motion joint by joint, but we also analyze the same joint bilaterally, side by side, one at a time, in other words. So I'm going to look at my left, and I'm going to say I start medial, and I finish lateral. I have to have left radial and joint supination. Okay, I'm done with this one. I start lateral and I end medial. I had to have right radial on a joint pronation. Yes? It's okay to say no. Any follow up questions on that one? See it? Let's do this one. Humor me if you wish. Stand up, please. Let's say we were um, in elementary school and we were about to do the pledge. So hand over your heart. Now what I want you to try to analyze is usually when your hand's over your heart, your elbow's at your side, right? I mean, I don't mean to assume like maybe you have like a different um, but hand over your heart, elbow at your side. Try to identify one of three positions. Are you mostly supinated? Are you mostly pronated? Or are you mostly semi-pronated? Don't answer. Try to figure it out. And also feel free. It's okay. Be good. Feel free to, once you kind of have what you think it is, feel free to ask a neighbor, what do you think? Because again, to me, that's the best line. When you either have the same answer, awesome, maybe we're on the right track. But when you have different answers, it gives you a chance to try to explain your position. And they can explain their position. And then maybe some connection happens, OK? So take a minute, and let's see if we can figure it out.
All right, guys, very important. Very important. It is common, and it's because of global revenue. It is common for you or anyone else to not purposefully move their radio on the joint when you're trying to see where it's at. I'll, I'll give you an example real quick. If my hand is facing the floor and I'm like, am I prone or I'm supine? I've seen students in the reel take their hand off and as they bring it down, they want their palm to face the floor. So they'll actually pronate as they come down, not realizing it and say, look, see, I was pronated. And I was like, you just did that. <laughs> So just be careful, be mindful when you're here, when you bring it back down, just make sure that you don't have the, remember that illusion that we did last week? Okay, be careful, keep on going. questions with hypotheticals, uh, thought experience, things that you can just kind of practically see and do. So what I'm going to do is put my hand over my heart and say, all right, if I was supinated, if I was in anatomical, I shouldn't be able to supinate from this position. Is that logical? Meaning that if my knee was in anatomical and it was extended, I shouldn't be able to have extension from there. Right? So if my hand's over my heart, I shouldn't be able to do this if I'm in a supinated position. So that tells me that I wasn't supinated. Is that logical? Okay. If I am pronated, fully pronated, I shouldn't be able to have pronation from this position. Is that logical? So. I'm closest to being in a semi-pronated position where, check this out, let's see if I can do this. I've never done this before, but I'm going to try. I'm going to reposition my arm globally and then move my body to show you where it was. Is that make sense? Most students, I say most, some students, before they kind of work this out, they'll say, all right, here I am, and I'm going to extend my elbow and then naturally supinate as I come back. And then miss the point that you could have done that when you were here. Yes, ma'am. Is it your radio the wrist doesn't twist. So the wrist in terms of options for it, flexion extension, radial on a deviation. So the wrist doesn't even have that option. It's a great question for the right now. It's a great question for the right now. Any follow-up questions on that one? Or if you want to use landmarks, my thumb, if I followed it, it's not lateral, and it's not medial, it's not lined up with my little bicep. Right? This would be lateral, this would be medial, this would be in the middle. Can you show the movement uh, back to the top of the mirror right there? Sure, sure. You can do it a couple of ways. I like to move the radial on the joint first because it lessens my chance of accidentally moving it when I'm moving my elbow. So if I want to go back to anatomical, I'm going to do two, um, two steps in terms of the joints we're talking about so far. So I'm going to move the shoulder out of this. Right radial on the joint supination. 
right elbow extension. And then my shoulder eventually is going to externally rotate, but we're not there yet. I could also do is just trick here to not move your radial on the joint. Right elbow extension first, and then supination out. So in other words, think of it like this. If I was in an anatomical position, and I said flex, Any other follow-up questions before we get to the next one? Okay. All right. Let's do this one. Left hand, palm down, right hand, palm up, and like you got to make like the sandwich. Okay. And from here, we're going to do this. <coughs> now, this is where, I, I, that's the radial joint. I want to emphasize the wrist as well. This is actually a next level for one we did last week. So make the sandwich left over right, but then also bring it closer to you to make your wrists have to move. So your fingers are parallel with the ground, pointing in front of you. And we're going to go from this position to that position. And I want you to tell me what happened. Open question. Give me movements that were significant. Left over right. Right over left. Remember last week we did this with just one hand? So all we're doing is adding both. I think that was from Lego movie. Can you say that one more time? Correct. Left is on top, and the left palm is facing down. Right palm is facing up. at Miriam's uh, study group session last time. Was that helpful? Awesome. Awesome. I got, I got her feedback from it, and it was positive, but uh, I, I wanted to ask you guys if it was positive as well. All right, let's, let's go, because I, I want to get to a few examples today. Motion, in terms of, so for you athletes, and, and we all did something, you know, you're in kinesiology. Either you did something or you enjoyed watching something uh, activity-wise. There's different strategies to hitting a softball or a baseball. There's different strategies to pitching, pitching coaches, quarterback coaches. In fact, sometimes you can have a system where, you know, you can, if you're in the right system, your potential may be fully unlocked because you fit that system, right? This is my system. This is how I teach motion because it works for me. It may not work for you, but you know what I want to work for you? Right answers and understanding things that are happening. So the first thing that I want to do, because I don't want to assume, I don't want my brain to play a trick on me. 
because our brains do it all the time, is I want to establish position. Where am I at? We analyze motion joint by joint. So let's have a wrist conversation first. My left wrist is flexed. My right wrist is extended. Does that make sense? That's where I'm trying to teach you guys to go first. It's something I think you can answer. It's something I think is the easiest, and it's something to get your confidence up. Hey, I know where this wrist is at. Relative to anatomical, it's flexed. And the right is extended. Maybe they stay like that. Maybe they don't. Let's see. Write it on the paper. I start with my left wrist flex and my right wrist extended, if it helps. Now my left wrist is extended and my right wrist is flexed. Whoa. My left wrist was flexed. Now it's extended. The only way for that to happen is to have extension. Left wrist extension. That's the only way. It may not look traditional, and that's okay. A lot of human motion isn't traditional. But the only way my left wrist can go from here to there is if it did this, and then eventually we're going to do that. Left wrist extension, right wrist started extended and ended flexed. Right wrist flexion. Good. And the motion was dang near proven. Like, remember junior high algebra? Like, if you got two variables of a three variable equation, you could solve for the third. Right? You got to have two, and then you could solve for the third. That's what this is. You have two. Start and finish. You have the information to solve for M, motion. Start, finish. Left wrist extension, right wrist flexion. And then it'd be the opposite to go back. How many remember, and it's gonna happen again, how many people remember the question on exam two where I didn't give you two variables? I just gave you one variable. It was a knee question. What was, and I didn't even ask for position of motion because you didn't have enough information to tell me motion. That's okay. What was the what was the answer? To the question, um, I, I think I put that there wasn't enough information. That's okay. The question was it was a picture, mm -hmm. and it was basically what do we know about this picture? And all we could tell because there was no context, there was no before and after, and there was no you go back to anatomical way. It was just a picture. That would be like saying if I, if you had a picture of my elbow. Could you tell me if I'm flexing or extending? Could you tell me if I have flexion or extension? All you know is that I'm flexed. So that's what I was getting at here, that to be able to solve for motion, we have to have enough variables. We can't just have the start position. We can't just have the finish position. If we just have that variable, all I could say is that my left wrist is flexed and my right wrist is extended, that's it. I have to have more. And that's what my motion gave me, right? I did the before, I did the after. So now I have enough to solve for the motion. All right, radio on a joint. Is my left prone or supine? Now, here is where the illusions. You may, your brain, and you have a lizard brain, and I have a lizard brain. That's our, like, instincts. That's our... Our, our ring the bell, we salivate. Our lizard brains want to say both thumbs must be in the same position because both thumbs are literally on the same side. Yes, globally, to the room's perspective, but not to the radio ulna joint's perspective. Does that make sense? My left is medial. But my right is lateral. So my right is supine and my left is prone. They're not in the same position. In the finish, my left is supine and my right is prone. 
So the only way that can happen is to have left radial ulnar joint supination and right radial ulnar joint pronation. So this is what happened at the same time. Simultaneous motion. Remember last week I did that silly little, like what, what it looks like when it's done one at a time? This is what happened one at a time. Left supination extension. Right pronation flexion. And the trick, or one of the tricks are that just because my fingers happen to move the same way globally, doesn't mean the joint moved the same way locally. That make sense? Awesome. Any follow-up questions to that example? Okay. How about we do a couple, let's end on a few easier ones, okay? What about something like this? Last time we started fingers to the left, how about this time we start fingers to your right? Fingers to your right. That's actually what you're hearing is my arthritis. Start, finish. To the right, to the left. Now dip, baby dip. Yeah, dip, baby. Oh gosh, all right, don't do that. If it, if it helps you, maybe it does, maybe some of you can skip this step, but maybe if you're trying to develop a process that works for you or works best for you before you get into a position of anything, maybe try to filter out, maybe it's not even a three foot putt, maybe it's a three inch putt. What joint moved? What joint had the most motion? Was it wrist, elbow, radia ulna, ankle? So the point is, is that if you could see that this was wrist, then at least that gives you a boxer's chance to get, because you know the wrist can only do four things. Right? So maybe that could help funnel it down. Maybe you feel overwhelmed with all the movement possibilities, but you know what it's not. It's not the ankle. It's not the knee. It's not the hip. Upper extremity, not the shoulder, not the elbow, not the radial ulna. If it was radial ulna, it would look like this. If it was the elbow, it would look like this. Like you could literally do little experiments on the test to narrow it down. Some of you might be able to just go straight to motion. Bless you and your ancestors. I don't assume. I want to know data. I want to know information. I want to take in as much information that's given to me. It's given, why not use it? It's there. What's my position? Where am I at? My right wrist is extended. Follow the fingers. My left wrist was flexed. Now my left wrist is extended and my right wrist is flexed. So having that before and after tells me my left wrist had to have left wrist extension and right wrist flexion. Cool? 
bilateral wrist extension would actually look like double doors. It actually makes sense. If I open those double doors in the room's transverse plane, they both have in the same motion. Open. So if these are the double doors, bilateral wrist extension would be the same thing. Bilateral wrist flexion, bilateral wrist extension. Now, unfortunately, our doors aren't fixed globally. So we can put our radial ulna joint in different positions where bilateral wrist flexion might look different than traditional doors. All right? That's okay. The wrists have no clue. That left door has no clue what the right door is doing. This left wrist has no clue what the right wrist is doing. Cool? cool. Any, que any questions? All right, on Wednesday, we're gonna start it to the shoulder. Shoulder and scapula.